Hey everybody, welcome to Seeing. This is a lecture put together specifically for artists to help us think about the ideologies and philosophies that most often underpin our practice, the way in which we break down reality and reconstitute reality onto canvas and paper or sculptural means, and the way in which we actually think about the world. You know, sometimes we forget about the power structures and the ideas that we carry with us when we look at the world and how we translate what we see. So I hope this lecture will be uh, useful for understanding better what it is that we do through this process of translation, how we do it, and what we might want to watch out for in terms of blind spots as well. I have an interest, a strong interest in nature and the representation of nature. And these are some of the books I published over the past 10 years. As you can see, they focus on the representation of animals uh, and plants in art mainly. I also work on climate change and the Anthropocene, you know, the time period in which many um, scholars agree now we live, which is, you know, um, a complicated time for our planet. Uh, I've been editing a journal called Antenna, the Journal of Nature and Visual Culture, for the past 13 years. You can actually uh, the, download 51 issues of the journal for free uh, online uh, at www.antenna.org.uk. Uh, or you can just Google the name of the journal and my um, name and it will come up. If you're interested in nature, in art, this is uh, a pretty uh, useful resource um, for many people who, who work in this field. And this is my uh, latest book, which is on mm. Lucian Freud and his paintings of plants. I don't know if you've ever come across the work of Lucian Freud. It's massive in uh, Britain and Europe. I always find that over here uh, a little less, probably due to historic contingencies. Uh, he's the nephew of the very famous Sigmund by the same surname. A really interesting character who painted plants like nobody else, as you can see here. And also in this fabulous uh, example. And um, for a number of reasons that I explain in the book, um, nobody had ever looked at his paintings of plants, despite the fact that they account for almost a fourth of his output, um, you know, plants are relegated to the lower rank of subjects in art, as we will talk about a little more about today. And uh, men and plants don't go well together in the minds of art historians, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. always about if women paint flowers and plants, then they get a shot. But men, moving on from the 17th century, 18th century in modern art, it's a complicated matter. So there I came in, put a book out, did really well, still doing really well, triggered a lot of interest and very important to me, um, hopefully bringing people who don't think about plants in art, culture and in the real world to reconsider what important roles plants play in our life. <laughs> So that's pretty much me. Today I still work at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and I also work at a museum uh, where I collaborate with many different departments. I work for the education department there, but I also work with marketing, membership, give lots of lectures and tours. As you know, everything has been on hold for the past few months. The museum is reopening on the 30th of July, but the education uh, programs will be probably the very last to resume in the order of priorities of the museum right now. Uh, we're really focusing on logistics, you know, people, traffic, and uh, ergonomics of the space. Mm -hmm. And hopefully you'll be able to visit soon. On that note, <laughs> I just wanted to frame our um, talk this morning between two polarities, because I know you, you think about um, looking, seeing, perception for your drawing, uh, looking at examples, influences, but also at how certain uh, approaches to representation can be important to your practice. And of course, optics are everything. You know, we look, we see, we consume the world with our gaze, but there is no optics in itself that is objective. Everything is um, defined, everything we see, everything we perceive is defined by a philosophy 
of some kind. Sometimes the philosophy is something that it's in the air, like you've picked it up from the cultural conversation around you, you picked it up from your upbringing, you can pick it up from reading books specifically. You know, many of my students read uh, the work of contemporary philosophers and, and my own as well about nature, and then you can see how certain ideas transfer into their work. So the optics of their work become informed by what they read in the work of uh, scholars and vice versa, you know. Uh, and there's something also fascinating about the philosophy that you bring within you, you know, your upbringing, your race, your gender. That's also part of your uh, personal philosophy. And w whenever you draw something or whenever you paint something, you mobilize these philosophies without knowing. That's part of the challenge sometimes to realize what are you vocalizing when you draw? What are you... Uh, bring into the table that you don't even uh, have considered carefully because it's it's just the air you breathe. It's your it's your element, right? So we're going to think about these uh, polarities today, but I also want to consider the notion of optics and philosophy in a broader context that is relevant to art history and just to the development of painting and drawing over the past 200 years, because the past 200 years are really special uh, in the development of art around the world. And I want you to consider a few things that I, I feel are very important when it comes to um, the practices of representation and how we perceive the world differently if we paint and draw today in comparison to somebody who paint during the Renaissance. So I want to look at three modalities and I'm oversimplifying here just so that, you know, we get a sense uh, and elements that we can use for our, our conversation. But uh, we can oversimplify and state that across the world in art, there are three ways in which you can represent everything. The first one is naturalism, and I'm just picking it as the first one because we have to start somewhere. It's not the best, it's not the only one, it's not the most important. But traditionally, naturalism is the depiction of objects in a style that closely matches our optical perceptions. So natural, naturalism entails a focus on detail and accuracy in the reproduction of an object. And an example of naturalism is this beautiful painting by Louise Moyon that we will look at in detail um, later on today. This is in our collection. And you can see that at a glance, this looks very naturalistic. You can also use the word realistic. It's the same, naturalism, realism in art. However, in modern and contemporary art, naturalism becomes complicated, uh, becomes the best, actually, uh, term of the two because realism is also a French movement that happens before Impressionism, so that gets people confused a lot if you talk about naturalism in art at that time. So naturalism, as I said, means that we represent things closely to the way they look, to our eye. And then we have stylization. Now, stylization can also be called synthesis. It's a depiction of objects in a way that selects and summarizes certain aspects of form and color for the purpose of producing a representation that does not accurately match optical perception. So with stylization, you're actually moving away from the challenge of representing reality the way we see it with our eyes. And that's an interesting uh, proposal for representation in itself, because I don't want to say that naturalism is objective or more kind of mechanical, but stylization entails a perhaps wider, broader um, bandwidth of your own interpretation of the subject. So an example of stylization is, of course, Pablo Picasso's Head of a Woman that we have in our collection, where you can barely recognize the subject. And we'll see as well what brings this change. You know, the idea of, of cubism is really fascinating because, again, it's not just Picasso's volition to paint something in a different style, but it's actually coming from a desire to do painting that had never happened before in the history of art. In this case, he decides to look at this woman from different angles and puts them all onto the canvas 
seen at once. That's why her face looks, you know, so faceted, so um, structured, because it's the condensation, stylization of different point of views uh, of the subject. And then the last um, modality of representation is abstraction. So abstract art does not represent objects in recognizable ways. It might or might not originate from optical perception of the real world. That means that abstraction is a departure from the real world. And you can start from the real world to create an abstract painting. You can look at a composition of fruit and turn it into something that becomes completely abstract. Or you can just start from your own imagination. You can start from colors, you can start from lines and let them lead you into representation. So this is an interesting uh, painting we have at the Art Institute of Chicago by Julie Merethu, who's a fantastic contemporary artist from Ethiopia who has really synthesized different languages of abstraction to create her own approach that, as you can see, it's very fluid, very um, loose in a sense. This image might look um, blurred to you from your screen, but it's actually the way the painting looks. She's playing with these notions of blurriness and out of focus because technically painting, apart from Richter and a few other artists who have explored this idea of the out of focus, tends to have this crispiness and she's really playing with this notion of perception here. What is abstraction useful for? Many things. In the history of art, abstraction has been associated with transcendence and spirituality because uh, of course these are things that we consider um, we consider bigger than us, that exceed our senses, that exceed our presence in the world. So abstraction helps us to represent things that are difficult to pin down. Like in this case, the title of Love Supreme that I'm sure uh, you're linking as well to other references involving music uh, and religion as well. Um, is really probably a subject that requires abstraction. You know, I'm thinking of John, Col John Coltrane and his love supreme in jazz, you know. It's like that idea of certain styles in art, whether it's music, whether it's uh, visual representation, capture things that other styles cannot. So these are the, the three polarities that I think could be useful uh, to, to think clearly about in your practice when you approach representation. And the um, broader context that I want to use to challenge us to think about these modalities is created by photography. You have to remember that prior to the invention of photography, which was invented in 1826, um, the only way we had to represent the world was to actually ask a painter to do it for us, or if we were artists, we did it for ourselves. Um, <clears throat> now, 1826 is a really important date because it's the um, birth of this very grainy image take, taken by Joseph Nisiphor Nieps. And this is an image from the roofs uh, opposite his home in La Gra. And you can see here that it's quite difficult to understand what's going on. First of all, because the materials he used were very rudimentary. This is really the first photograph that didn't fade away, right, when he came out of the darkroom. And um, it took eight hours to take. Can you imagine the shutter of your camera open for eight hours, capturing the shadows moving as the sun you know, moves across the sky? And that's why it's so like grainy. But it didn't take long for the technology of photography to improve. This is the camera he used. Those of you who have used pinhole cameras, this is basically a sophisticated pinhole camera, right? It's a box, and as you can see, there's no lens at the front. So another reason why the picture looks so grainy. But like I said, it wasn't long. By 1839, uh, somebody else who worked with Nieps very closely and as, as an assistant, Louis Daguerre, invented the daguerreotype. And that's when photography really takes off. This is a daguerreotype. And at the Art Institute of Chicago, we have a fantastic resource called the Photography Study Room, where you 
can book an appointment and they will take out for you beautiful examples of daguerreotypes or any other kind of photography you're interested in, in seeing as an object. Uh, and you can actually play with some of them. You can hold them in your hands with gloves. And there is nothing like seeing a daguerreotype in, uh, in the flesh because the daguerreotype was printed on metal plates, not on paper. So it had a, a holographic quality. You looked at the daguerreotype and it was almost, it was metal, a metal plate polished to the standard of a mirror. So you had to kind of orient it in front of you to get the right lighting. And when you hit the right spot, the image just appeared with this holographic intensity and then disappeared a little. It's very, very fascinating. So you can imagine why everyone was in love with the daguerreotypes in the 1840s and 50s around the world. You know, it was a French invention, uh, the daguerreotype, but uh, France gifted it to the world. Uh, and that's how it just spread like a wildfire. They left out Britain because, you know, the French and Brits don't like each other. So Britain had to reinvent photography on its own terms, which is fascinating. And that's actually the kind of photography that we inherited because it was more commercially viable and more um, practical. Not quite as detailed, though, as the daguerreotype. The daguerreotype introduced this incredible detail. Look at this cat and the little ears. He moved a little, and the daguerreotype registered that movement in its kind of minute uh, sweetness. It's really fascinating. This is a, um, an illustration that shows us, made at the time, shows us all the enthusiasm for the daguerreotype in Paris. Um, now... The enthusiasm for photography was triggered by a number of things that for us, they're actually even like tricky to understand. Imagine a world with no photographs. Today, you've already seen probably like over a hundred pictures, right? Whether you flick through a book, whether you looked at a magazine or a newspaper, it's second nature to us. But try to imagine a world that even during the 19th century was kind of uh, image starved. You had to be rich to have paintings in your home, right? And what photography does is to introduce this economy of the picture that's mass produced. And I'm not telling you that it was cheap. If you wanted to have your daguerreotype taken, working class people saved up a whole year to be able to sit in front of a photographer for that one plate of themselves. But of course, there's this idea of having a memory of yourself that is not just a painter's impression. And I don't mean to devalue the importance of artists, but there was something magical about the idea that what you have on this little plate, they were all very small, it's not somebody's rendition of you, but it's an imprint of you, right? There was a magic quality to photography that to us has really gone into the trash, thanks to Instagram and all the social media that make the medium of photography looks so readily available and consumable to us. So you have to imagine uh, artists at this time thinking, okay, now we have this invention, which by the way, was invented by not very talented artists. Nieps couldn't really draw very well, so he dreamt of a technique that could allow him to draw without his hands, you know, and there came photography. The gear was the same. They're all not particularly talented artists. So the talented artists who live around the 1850s and 60s are wondering, what am I going to do with this invention? Some really feared that they could be out of work because people were so excited to have photographs, even the upper classes. A photograph is not quite a painting, right? So it's really fascinating um, to see how society responds. And I wanted us to remember whatever we look at today that was made before the birth of photography, you have to remember that those artists never used a photograph to create those paintings, right? So that poses a number of challenges to their practice that today very few artists want to be involved with. For instance, I wanted to begin looking at still life painting. This is a fantastic work in our collection. And look at the amount of detail that went into the making of this canvas. By the way, this is massive. It's, if I remember correctly, eight feet by Five. It's a really large, large painting. The man is life-size. And Franz Snyder, who worked with Rembrandt, 
uh, became a master at painting animals and plants. And I'll explain to you why. This is part of the philosophy. It's not just because he loved to paint animals and plants, which he was very clearly talented about. But imagine painting this without photographs, right? We're in 1614. Photography is like over 200 years away. And how do you paint this? Well, there's a challenge here. The animals, once they're dead, rot. There's no refrigeration here apart from blocks of ice that allow you to keep these animals fresh long enough for you to complete such a monumental canvas. So you have to imagine the intuition of these artists, right? You have to imagine their ability to compose a scene like this that never really existed on a table. These animals were never there on a table at once for the artist to paint and he was not able to take a picture of them and then copy that picture. So think about the challenges of lighting. We also have lights in our studios, right? Artificial lighting. Lucian Freud painted daytime paintings and nighttime paintings. It would continue with artificial lighting all the way into three o'clock in the morning. These artists had to deal with the sun constantly moving in the sky. So can you imagine what a challenge it is to paint these animals correctly with the level of detail we see here Bearing in mind that they didn't have artificial lighting of good quality like we do today. So they could set up candles in their studios, you know, they could set up haids, but not quite as practical as they are for us today, not quite as immediate. What is this painting about? This is a parable, it's a metaphor, an allegory that is totally religious. So I can read this very quickly for you because I don't want to spend too time just on this work. But the man on the left hand side, as you can see, is very successful. He has a beautiful market stall and is probably wealthy. This is symbolized by the figs. See, there is a, a canister he holds filled with figs. Figs symbolize wealth at this time in European painting. Right below him is this little kid. We're going to return to the little kid after we do the round of the animals that we see on the table. And not all of them have specific symbolisms that we know about. I'll say a few words about that later. But you can see a dove right, taking flight right on the right hand side. That symbolizes the Holy Spirit. Then you have a boar with the mouth wide open. That symbolizes gluttony. You move down from the um, boar to the peacock. That symbolizes resurrection. Then you move to the hare, which symbolizes purity of heart. There's a number of animals here, sorry, not the hare, the uh, deer, that symbolizes purity of heart. There's a number of animals here on the table that symbolize youth, and right below, a confrontation between two cockerels that's being keenly observed by a black cat that symbolizes evil. And you can clearly see the eyes of the cat Right? The body is as black as the shadow in which it disappears. And then there's a swan. Now, the swan is really interesting because to us today, a swan is associated with love, right? However, at the time, swan was, swans were associated with betrayal. And that's because the plumage of the, the, the animal is white. But once the feathers are plucked, the skin is black. So... That was the notion of the animal lying about its identity. So betrayal is what takes us back to the child. The child is stealing from the old man. You can see his hand going into his pocket, pulling out a bag of money. Most likely the child was a helper who was meant to set up the table with the, uh, with the market owner, but it ends up that way. So what is this painting about? Religion. This is all about a man who's led his life in the light of religion and has now got to a point where he can reap the rewards of his very hard work. And there's an ammunition here to remember to keep your eyes open because evil lurks everywhere, under the table in the shape of a cat or in the shape of a kid who you have helped that is now taken away from you. There's another big canister, as you can see there on the right, uh, between right above this one, that contains other fruits. And those are also highly symbolic. There's grapes, there's apples and pears. Those are the quintessential signatures of religious still life painting. 
and they represent any everything to do with the passion of Christ, his birth, the Madonna. We'll look at that representation in a minute through this other beautiful work that we have in our collection. So this is Louise Moyon, uh, who's a very talented female artist, very unusual at this time in the history of the um, Renaissance and the Baroque to find a female artist becoming successful uh, in, in her own right. As you will remember, women were not encouraged to take on art um, as a professional career. But there is something interesting that happens at this time, which I'm going to talk to you about in a second, uh, which brings women to paint flowers and fruits as a professional choice. This is absolutely amazing again. All that we said earlier applies. No photography, no light source that's fixed. So imagine the challenge of putting together all these fruits for the work. Some of these fruits actually come from the study of images that appeared in botanical illustration books, right, which become popular at the time. So you have to imagine different sources from which the artist is drawing real apples, real pears, real uh, grapes, but also representations. Why? Because these fruits don't ripen at the same time of the year, right? So these are impossible compositions. Once again, as I said earlier, they represent the passion of Christ. The cherries represent the blood of Christ. The grapes are about the passion of Christ. And these apricots and plums are all about the Madonna. Apricots uh, and the shape of them represented femininity. Uh, and the Madonna is a recurring symbol, of course, in these representations unlike Joseph, who's totally out of the picture. We don't know exactly what the asparagus bunch was about, but it appears a lot in paintings at this time. And some art historians have claimed that it just represents uh, abundance, wealth. Some have claimed fertility. But what's fascinating here, there are two very fascinating things. Every painting made at this time, every still life painting made at this time, includes an idiosyncratic element that becomes very hard for us to decode because it's usually down to the conversation between the commissioner and the artist. See on the left hand side there's a um, there's two broad beans right in a pod. Now art historians have been thinking about this for a while wondering what the hell is like broad beans doing there in a pod and then right next to it there's another pod with a few peas, two big peas and three smaller peas. Eventually, um, main consensus has it that um, it's a representation of the family of the commissioners. So the broad beans are the father and mother and the peas are the kids. I have taken a screen grab of this to show you a detail. Unfortunately, the quality is not as good as I'd love it to be, but you can see right on the left, right um, below that big peach, there's a black thing, which is a fly. Now, there are three flies in this painting, and they symbolize death. Surprise, surprise. And they're situated strategically so that one is also uh, sitting on the broad, uh, the broad bean pod, right? So kind of perhaps symbolizing the anxiety of the parents that they will uh, pass away at some point soon. And I wanted to show you this other incredible example of still life painting in our collection, um, which is always mind boggling. Uh, beautiful flowers once again. You can imagine the dexterity of the artist, right? Uh, these flowers can't be fresh at unison for the time it took to make this painting. So this again is another collage um, activity in which some of these flowers come come from um, real life uh, study and others come from the representation of other artists as well as uh, botanical illustration books. These flowers are also symbolic. Um, the symbolism of flowers is very complicated but in this case the tulip represents love, the poppy represents death, roses tend to represent love, and what I find really fascinating in this painting is the presence of a butterfly and a bumblebee. 
Never mind that little curtain. I'm going to talk to you about the curtain in a minute. That curtain is amazing, isn't it? It looks like it's made of fabric and like you could just reach and pull it over the painting. Before we get to the curtain, the butterfly is on the right hand side and the bumblebee is almost invisible here, but I have a, a um, close up that will show it to us. So that's the bumblebee, right? If you want to I'll bring it back to context. Uh, the bumblebee is on the left hand side where you see that fuzzy flower. So the bumblebee was used in these paintings to symbolize, it's actually uh, pollinating and feeding on a thistle. The, the bumblebee symbolized labor, right? Because they spend their time doing work. That was the understanding. The butterfly that we see there, beautifully painted, symbolizes the human soul. And it's really the representation that we encounter from classical Greece all the way to this point. Butterflies were associated with the human soul because of how delicate they are when they fly and the elegance of the flight and their fragility as well. Art historians are not sure, again, as scientists are not sure how much of the metamorphosis process have been understood at this time. Uh, but eventually the butterfly becomes also the symbol of resurrection because of the chrysalis, the caterpillar and the adult form. So what's with the curtain? The curtain was partly uh, a um, joke because in northern parts of Europe this fashion developed whereby art, um, owners of works of art would actually place a curtain, a real curtain, in front of paintings to prevent them from getting ruined. So you can imagine getting ruined by, by sunlight. So you can imagine how funny that painting must have been when uh, you have your guests over and you pull the curtain and haha there's another curtain that's been pulled and it's like the sort of trompe l'oeil that really uh, has a pun embedded in it but it also originates from a classical um, narrative so think about the philosophies that feed into these representations we have religion informing the representations of the flowers the insects are there because the religious philosophy says you have to have these symbols in place so that the painting has a certain meaning. But we also have classical mythology coming into the picture to add uh, the little curtain. So there's a beautiful story about two artists, Zeuxis and Parasius, who had a painting competition of the kind we no longer have today. And um, Zeuxis Basically, the challenge was that the two of them had to confront each other uh, and paint the most realistic, naturalistic image they possibly could. So Zeuxis ended up painting beautiful grapes. And you can see the painting on the right hand side there. Now, apparently, the grapes were so naturalistic that birds came from the sky and started to peck at the painting. And you can see them there, right? So. Zeuxis was all excited. I thought, there you go, I won because I fooled animals to believe my grapes are real. And then the group, as you can see, the two artists and the judges moved to the work of Parasius. And Zeuxis said, okay, pull that curtain so we can see what you've painted. And Parasius said, that is the painting. He painted the curtain, right? So who was the best here? The one artist who fooled the animals or the one artist who fooled another artist, right? So you can see how all these ideas filter into the making of that painting and ultimately define the painting uh, the way it is. Just to give you more context of the philosophies that came into that painting and the ones we have seen up until now, the Protestant Reformation is the real reason why the explosion of still life painting happens uh, in Northern Europe. Uh, you will remember this guy, Martin Luther, who uh, basically caused a major trouble for the Roman Church, splitting the church and starting off the Protestant Reformation. Now, according to the Protestant Church, um, images and art were intermediaries, undesirable intermediaries in our relationship with God. So, uh, Art is no longer allowed, religious art is no longer allowed in Protestant uh, churches. And that's because Martin Luther had a problem, I understand it, with the Vatican. 
At the time, the Vatican wanted to build St. Peter's. Those of you who have been to St. Peter's know how fancy it is, right? The sculptures, the marble, they needed a lot of money. The size, it's absolutely huge. So they needed money. And what they did was inventing the indulgences. Indulgences were basically seats in heaven you could buy if you were rich enough. So let's say you kill the man, but you can give the church an X amount of money. Um, you will be cleansed of your sins and purchase your seat in heaven. The money would have gone to build St. Peter's and pay for the art, right? So you can see how he had the point. The art is corrupting the church. So Martin Luther uh, ruins the show for uh, the Roman church, and that leads to the longest meeting in the history of the world. Luckily, they didn't need to be on Zoom, right? <laughs> they did it in person in Trent, northern Italy, between 1545 and 1563. Every summer, the most important cardinals in Italy congregated to discuss how to counterbalance the Protestant Reformation. And it is at these meetings that at some point they discuss art. So if Protest the Protestant Church no longer allows the representation of beautiful religious imagery in churches, the Roman Church will do the opposite. And that's how you get the Baroque in Italy, France, and Spain. Beautiful paintings of saints and Madonnas everywhere. They become larger. They become more dramatic than ever. <laughs> There are naked people everywhere. The idea is to dial up the religious art to claw back the faithfuls from the Protestant church that to the Roman church looks very bare and very, very minimalist. So art becomes this uh, political tool, right? But in the North, artists still have to make a living. They're like, okay, well, the Protestant church doesn't want us to paint Madonnas and Jesuses. What are we gonna paint? still lives with fruits, flowers, animals, to convey religious meaning, but to bypass the restrictions of the Protestant church. So you can see how much philosophy, cultural uh, inclinations and constrictions, as well as artistic knowledge, congregate into the making of these paintings, right? Again, your optic, your representation, your approach to what you're representing is never just objective and it's never just your own uh, personal view of what you do. And from there, I wanted to take us to this amazing work um, by Oksai. Oksai is one of the most important Japanese artists. This is a fantastic work in our collection, but it's a woodblock print. So, so many times when I... Um, work at the museum, somebody who's visiting the city says, oh, can you please take me to see the Uxai way? And I'm like, I wish I could, but it's in storage. It came out last year for this amazing exhibition. And not only it came out, it came out with two brothers and sisters uh, because the exhibition was on the variation of tonality in Japanese woodblock prints. And we had three on the wall next to each other um, to show how different they were and to understand how they drive Japanese prints collectors mad. Because not only you want to have the best of the tonalities available, but you wonder which is the closest to what the artist meant, right? So it becomes really complicated, but in an interesting way. So um, Oksai and woodblock prints are a massive revolution in the history of Western art. You will remember that Japan led a political and cultural life that was extremely um, secluded from the rest of the world, but the United States in the 1850s opened up the um, commerce and Britain as well, of course, is part of the picture. And the um, influx of woodblock prints in Europe changes the perspective of artists because you have to remember like i said earlier that your perspective on what you paint is always informed by a philosophy that's um predominant your cultural upbringing your experiences and generally your interest but if your everything around you is classical western art you will still operate in a box right 
So the influx of non-Western art into um, the Western world made these artists who come after, like the Impressionists, really find freedom, aesthetic freedom, in these beautiful works. First of all, I don't know how familiar you are with woodblock, woodblock prints, but basically the artist would create the scene as a painting, right, as a scene on paper in this case, and then uh, craftsmen would proceed to transfer the drawing, trace it onto a woodblock, and then use the woodblock as a stamp. So you would basically apply the color on the woodblock, place the paper on it, press it down real good, lift it, and then the image would appear. It requires a lot of work. It's incredibly complicated, but it was mass-produced images, right? It was the beginning of mass-produced images um, that changed the history of representation. And it wasn't invented in Japan at this point. It was actually invented in China thousands and thousands of years prior, but they become essential to modern art in Europe as well at this time. So what are the characteristics, aesthetic characteristics, that become interesting to artists? You can see here the linearity. Do you see that black line around the great wave at the very top? And also the flatness of colors, like the beautiful blue juxtaposed to a lighter hue. There's uh, indigo, there's shades uh, of blue, and, and then that pink in the sky. There's something really fascinating about this flatness. There is perspective here, but you can see that the perspective is layered very clearly by the waves. So the impact of these images on Impressionism is massive. Right? Without these, you would have not had Impressionism. And I wanted to look at the work of an Impressionist artist called Mary Cassatt, who we have in our uh, collection and who is not exhibited enough because we have over 60 pieces by Mary Cassatt, but there is barely one on show at any given time. And uh, this is the afternoon tea party, which is actually a uh, color aquatint and dry point. So you can actually see, however, the resonances, right? The um, similarities, the aesthetic similarities between the flat tones of Japanese print, the black outline that we see defining the image, and the overall interest in everyday life. Now, I know that the, sh the scene I showed you by Oksai doesn't quite look like everyday life, you know, this massive wave, but uh, that's also another interesting idea the Impressionists borrow from Japanese prints, because the Japanese tended to paint everyday life a lot more than it was happening in Western art at the time. So this is a beautiful painting by Mary Cassatt, you know, when we think Impressionism, we think Monet, we think Pissarro. I'm going to show you a couple of Impressionist works by these artists, too, because, you know, our museum is famous around the world because we have the best collection of Impressionism in the world outside France. Um, but this painting is really interesting because, again, going back to the points I'm making today, the idea of the philosophy and the idea of the optics, Impressionism is all about seeing with your eyes, right? Impressionism rejects classical art. It rejects this idea that you should be painting the past. It rejects the idea that you should be painting in the studio. So Impressionist artists go outside because they want to encounter colors and light with their eyes. And in doing so, they also establish that they need to paint quickly. That's why we see the brushstroke in such prominent way. The idea is to capture light before it moves and to capture your own impression. Why do they want to capture their own impression, hence Impressionism? Because of photography, right? Remember when I said how photography changed our lives and the way we look at the world? If photography captures the world the way we see it, almost objectively, then artists said, I have to turn painting into my own subjective medium, my own personal view of what is in front of me. Now, Mary Cassatt was particularly talented at this, but one thing I find very important about Mary Cassatt is how, as a woman in France, she couldn't do what Monet was doing with his paintings. She couldn't do what Pissarro was doing with his paintings. At this time, and until the 1940s and 50s in other parts of Europe, women 
in France were not allowed to walk alone on the street. The assumption was that they were prostitutes if they did, and therefore they would receive a lot of unwanted attention. You might remember as well that terrible video from um, New York that circulated a few years ago that showed us how much women put up with just walking around the streets today. There was this uh, woman who was walking around and a camera, somebody with a camera behind her documenting all these like insults or attentions, unwanted attentions and abuse, right? That uh, would happen in a city like New York only a few years ago. So you can imagine what the scenario was at this time in, in Paris. So what does it mean to a female artist who aspires to paint outside like their male counterparts? Well, she can't, but she can still be outside close to a balcony, on the balcony, or in the garden. So Mary Cassatt and Berthe Morisot, who are the female protagonists of Impressionism, develop this genre that is entirely theirs more than anybody else, which entails painting in these spaces of vulnerability that are kind of extensions onto the world, but protected, the balcony, right? They can enjoy the lighting, they can enjoy the scene, but not be exposed to the danger of the real mm -hmm. world. They are equally prisons and oases, right? That's the, the strange uh, paradox of the balconies and gardens of Mary Cassatt and Berthe Morisot. Uh, when Monet paints a garden, it's by volition, it's by choice. You know, it's a privilege for him to paint a garden. For these women, it's the only thing they can do most of the time, if not always. So again, going back to the point of what you bring to the table when you represent, right? The idea that as women, they couldn't be outdoors defined everything they painted, the subjects they painted, the, their friends doing what? In this case, I love the fact that this woman is reading, you know, because this is the beginning of that feminist moment of women actually educating themselves and stepping out of that patriarchal stronghold, right? So their subjects become also telling and important to the moment uh, in, in time. And the revolution of photography continues to change the way artists look at reality because in 1861, color photography is invented and it looks like this, invented by Maxwell in Northern Britain. And the colors are created artificially, right? So they're not particularly appealing, but it doesn't take long for photography to start improving. So when you look at dates, this is really telling. 1877, this color photograph of a landscape is already giving uh, troubles to impressionist artists who wonder, what am I going to do with painting? Same with this example right here. As you can see, the green looks a little like over the top, right? And this is also the time in which scientists become interested in the theories of color. So Michel Chevrol uh, works with what will become the important revelation of the color wheel, which you have probably all used in your practice. Can you imagine prior to the invention of the color wheel, artists used colors based on how previous artists that used colors, right? So this is a tool of power for many, many artists. It now tells them what are complementary colors, what are the primary colors, what are the secondary colors, and it allows the impressionists to explore clashes that they already see happening in Japanese woodblock prints. So the clash between orange and blue, which was like one of the best things for Monet, and I can only agree with him, um, comes from the color wheel and also ex uh, showing and uh, showing an interest for the chromatic balances and clashes of Japanese woodblock, woodblock prints because of the different cultural background that didn't inform their color juxtapositions. Even your taste, our taste on what color goes well next to a color is partly personal and partly dictated by our cultural upbringing, by our experiences, by the norm, right? That's the, the biggest word, I guess, here, the norm. Uh, another work in our collection by Monet, classic landscape. And I'm veering towards landscape because you will see how important it is to the end of our um, talk today. This is another interesting work by um, Pissarro. 
uh, from our collection. I wanted to show you this because um, Pissarro was very daring when it came to his approach to colors and the brush stroke. And in this case, he was criticized because the uh, reviewers, the critics, the art critics couldn't quite tell what it is that he was painting. They were being mean, but they basically told him, why have you painted this butter invasion, right, over the town? They, they didn't allow him to enjoy the fact that he painted snow. But how do you paint snow in an impressionist way? You know what Spain, uh, Spain, what paint, painting snow entails, what snow does? Uh, it reflects light in very interesting ways. So what Pissarro was trying to do here was not to just paint white expanses like classical art would do to suggest the idea of snow. He was trying to capture that reflection of the sky onto the snow, the reflection of other objects onto the snow. You know, Impressionism is so keen on capturing reflections of objects on objects and light on objects. So, yeah, you know, for being very an experimental and breaking the mold, you had to put up with a lot of negative criticism. And as we know as well, from Impressionism comes uh, Cezanne, who was also criticized extensively for showing the world from his own personal perspective, but who then laid the foundations for Cubism. So when you look at this beautiful work in our collection, it's hard sometimes to remember that what's groundbreaking here is the fact that he painted it from three different points of view. Cezanne said something really important about painting in a letter. He said, why should I paint from one point of view, which is basically the foundation of classical art, when I walk around objects to explore them? So why not bring my ability to move around objects into the painting? And you can see that here where he is uh, not aligning the table deliberately because the left-hand side of the table is actually <clears throat> lower than the right-hand side. The biscuits look up into the sky instead of going sideways. Nothing in this painting is stable. And people didn't understand it at the time. They just thought, oh, great. Good old Cezanne is not even able to paint a still life anymore. But you can see the groundbreaking proposition here. And much of this also comes from photography. The idea that photography at the time couldn't capture the world from different angles. So Cezanne is pushing painting to a safe place once again to do something altogether different. I also wanted to look at George O'Keeffe and another massive represented artist in our collection with beautiful works and her interest in nature and how she uses nature to convey meaning that it's symbolically personal. We have looked at the symbolism of classical art, right? Where we're thinking about flowers that have been assigned, meaning that anyone would know. And when I say anyone at the time, I mean people who had religious knowledge and who were um, erudite, you know, people who could read, people who knew uh, painting. In this case, George O'Keeffe creates her own symbolism through nature. And you can see here that this simple daisy that represents fragility at the base of uh, the painting is juxtaposed to the brightness of these beautiful golden leaves that nonetheless bear the uh, scars of having been alive, right? This is perhaps a juxtaposition between something dying and something coming to life. There is something of the passage of time that is nonetheless very, very personal. You know, the paintings I showed you earlier, all those still lives from the Baroque, encapsulate this idea of the passing of time. The illusion of those beautiful fresh flowers and fruits was that they were going to wilt. That was the implication of those images. But in this case, you can see how um, George O'Keeffe is actually showing us the wilted, the, the wilted leaves, the damaged leaves with pride. There's no illusion. There's no desire to just give us Baroque beauty. It's very bare. It's very to the bone. It's very simple, but it's very intimate. It's very personal, right? So you can see her philosophy here uh, overrides the um, tradition of how plants and flowers are represented in the Baroque tradition. And she was also very much informed by Surrealism. So Surrealism 
uh, brings her to be fascinated and explore subjects like the skulls that she finds in the desert of New Mexico. And uh, this one here in particular, again, is concerned with ideas of death and rebirth. She actually collected the skulls from the desert and then took them to the studio to paint extensively. And this is what she said about the skulls. I just wanted you to have this quote because I think it's stunning. She says, to me, they are as beautiful as anything I know. To me, they are strangely more living than the animals walking around. The bones seem to cut more sharply to the center of something that is keenly alive on the desert, even though it is vast and empty and untouchable and knows no kindness with all its beauty. I think that's the artist perspective there. You know, it's really like the ability to see something uh, so meaningful and deep in connection. You, what I really love is that how she's being able to see it not as an object in itself, but as part of the beauty of the desert and its um, being that knows no kindness. You know, this idea of the desert just being beautiful and yet knowing no kindness. I think it's extremely poetic and she really uh, captures that in, in these works uh, entailing the skulls and the um, calico roses that we have seen. You know, that the, the calico roses that uh, adorn the skulls we just saw are actually um, representations, celebrations of death uh, and connections to the afterlife. So you can see how she's celebrating life, the cycle of life and death through that image itself. And I wanted to wrap up um, our talk on the representation of nature through um, the artists we exhibit at the Art Institute of Chicago with two images by David Bay. These are recent acquisitions. And I don't know if you had the opportunity to see the fantastic exhibition of David Bay uh, called Night Coming Tenderly Black that was at the Art Institute, um, I think it was sometimes last year. It was absolutely stunning. The photographs are incredible. And if you think when you look at this, oh, I need to fine tune the brightness on my screen because I can't see anything. That's not it. They are contrasted deliberately by the artist. Uh, these are gelatin silver prints, so they look stunning in presence. You know, they have a, a slight three-dimensionality to them, like almost like the daguerreotype in a sense. They have a presence as objects, and it's beautiful. Uh, gelatin silver print is one of the most traditional classic processes. You know, David Bay is a fantastic photographer, very knowledgeable in many different uh, processing techniques um, has decided to go back to this uh, older technology uh, on purpose. And there's something about, to me, this was like incredible on a number of ways in terms of my own experience, but also in terms of seeing and really how it underpins the very ideas that we have explored today. And I thought it was interesting to explore this idea of seeing uh, through photography on a course that's actually on drawing, right? And continue that conversation between the two media. So I give you an idea, I want to give you an idea of how this was displayed to understand uh, the impact. Upon entering the gallery space, as you know, you would turn left or right usually uh, to look for the, the text that tells you something about the exhibition. And I remember clearly the strange feeling of, um, you know, surprise, not seeing text around me when I walked in. So I walked into the gallery, looked left, picture, looked right, picture. And I'm like, okay, I get it. We really are meant to explore this without any instructions. Totally fine, I'm game. I'm looking at these pictures and they are, you know, you start wondering about this contrast quality, they look so consistent. All of them look consistent. So you think this is deliberate and they look beautiful. There's something about it. And of course, you knew going in uh, that the title was Night Coming Tenderly Black. So you think there's something about the night, you know, that the, the photographer is trying to um, propose here that I can clearly see. However, the text then was placed on a wall that you had to walk around after you had seen and explored a certain amount of images. The text was hidden behind the wall. And then when you read the text, the whole work started to make so much more sense. But it hit you 
in the face because it really revealed what I was experiencing as a white person born in Milan, who lived in London, who moved to the United States, in opposition to what David Bay, who's an African-American artist, wanted us to empathize with the perspective of what turns out to be black slaves who were migrating from the south of the United States on what used to be called the Underground Rail, which was a network of pathways, streets and safe houses they could use and stop at to navigate this super long journey from the south to places like Chicago or even further north, right? So upon reading that piece of information, I felt like, you know, there are moments when you are in an exhibition, you feel like the ground shifts from under your feet and you really know that that is art you will never forget because it has changed something in the way you look at yourself, in the way you look at the world, it's made you aware of a whole new optic. So in my case, what it really made me aware of is that the history of Western re representation of landscape that we have uh, celebrate it so much, from Constable to Turner to Passan. It's a history that it's entirely defined by our own social and cultural position in the landscape. So when you think about the beautiful landscapes of the 17th and 18th century that were commissioned by the landowners as a sign of pride, right, of their ownership of the land, of course, they look beautiful with the sunshine, you know, streaming down these beautiful trees and, and water because it's the power. It's their power that informs the vision of the artist who's painting for them and has talked to them about how do you want this beautiful property to look like. I want it to look like triumph, like my own triumph as a merchant, my own triumph as, you know, an aristocratic person. But what does the same landscape look like to a slave who's escaping in the middle of the night, running for freedom through a landscape they have never explored during the day sometimes or never had the opportunity to enjoy? This is what these images really uh, made me realize. It's like, these are landscapes with no joy there is a promise in them of freedom, right? But there is fear all over them. Like this house with a white picket fence. Um, the white picket fence says it all. It's a boundary, but it's also an American um, icon. And the house behind the picket fence, does this picture represent the America that it's precluded to the slaves? Or does it represent the safe house that they will find help in and that they know about through the underground rail? There's also something interesting about influences here. I want to also show you the other image, image I love from this series, which is um, Forest. I love Forest because it really brings us back even closer in to the notion of the forest in Western art and how to us, the forest can afford to be the place of fairy tales, the place of nightly battles, confrontations, the place of witches and mystery, right? But here, the forest is fear, true fear. It's true unknown, but it's also hope of something at the other end of the forest, a different hope that wasn't part of my makeup, you know, that wasn't part of my cultural makeup, that wasn't part of my experience of the forest either. So that's why I found this so uh, incredibly powerful. And I also wanted to mention the two references because we've been talking so much about optics and philosophies. Uh, the aesthetic of the images comes from Roy de Carava, uh, a uh, photographer that David Bay very much uh, loved throughout his career because of his engagement in representations um, of African-American history and the way in which he dealt with gelatin silver print. And then the title of the uh, series itself, Night Coming Tenderly Black, 
comes from a poem by Langston Hughes. And this poem is called Dream Variations. And the um, line that inspired David Bay says, night coming tenderly, black like me. So you can imagine the idea of night here again, you know, there is something interesting about the night as something comforting, something that enables hiding, you know, that's why a lot of the moving up north happened at night instead of during the day, but also the night as something dangerous. I also love the fact that David Bay wanted to make this series in black and white because I think it also metaphorically, the choice of the medium speaks to the black and white historical reality that he's addressing, that he's exploring. And you have to remember that he's looking at images. I mean, these images were taken now, 2017, right? On that uh, underground rail. So he's also connecting the present with the past, the history with the present, how much of that past is still percolating through the reality that we inhabit, the landscape that we inhabit. And how interesting is it that this is the same landscape for everybody, but the way we perceive it because of our history, because of our culture, because of our race, because of our gender, makes it a very different landscape to everyone. And on that note, we've come to an end of what I have to say. Um, if you want to follow me on Instagram, there I am. And uh, you can also find more lectures on different subjects on YouTube. If you just Google my name and art lectures, I'll come up.